Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Mickey Siebert, and I'm sure I'll forget she, uh, uh, some things. She has a very, very long and impressive background that's impossible to remember everything she's done. Uh, the most important thing, perhaps, for this group is she was the first woman to have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange in 1967, <coughs> December 28th? Yes, indeed. One of the first questions we actually would like to ask is, like, um, how did you actually have the courage to do this? What special qualities do you think you possessed or that you had that allowed you to be a groundbreaker? Well, I was doing very, very big business. And I could not, a large firm would not hire me and pay me what they were paying the men. Yes, Period. But there were other women that had that same problem, but you moved first. Well, I, I probably had the most extreme because oh, I was and, a And what you were worth and what you were being paid, the biggest gap. I had the biggest gap. So you could function as someone with a seat on it. You knew you could function. Well, successfully yes. as someone with a seat on the New Yes, York but side. Jerry Sy gave me the uh, idea. Okay, we Jerry like Sy. Jerry Sy is a very famous person from the late 60s. What did he say to you? I've, I've heard the story. I, but tell them. I, well, I asked Jerry, I said, Jerry, what large firm can I go to where I'll get credit on the business I'm doing? And he said, don't be ridiculous. You won't. Buy a seat. Work for yourself. And I said to him, don't you be ridiculous. <laughs> and he said, I don't think there's a law against it. And I took the Constitution of the New York Stock Exchange home, and I felt that I qualified. <laughs> how much objections did you find? A lot. Well... And how did you get over them? There were, it was a... Really, people made all sorts of outrageous complaints. And oh, said I mean, all sorts of it was not nice. Uh, the exchange, you know, I put the bid card in. I got the seat because I did have a business reason. No other woman who had applied had a business reason. But I could prove them the business I did. So you had a legit, very legitimate. I had a legitimate reason. Yeah. Uh, okay, could we go on to the um, 70s? Sure. Uh, uh, it was a period of great inflation. And it's our feeling here we're entering a similar period. And I'm sure you remember Arthur Burns and the Fed policy at that time. And we'd like to know your opinion of how similar is uh, Greenspan Bernanke right now to Burns. Well, I saw the period of the no, mine, yeah, of the 70s, when the price of oil went up. Oil had gone up, and it went from $4 in 1963 to $30 for $35. And you've seen something similar seems to be happening today. And this is much what's, higher levels. And, and this, and yes, mm -hmm. and I, because I was superintendent of banks then. And I put my firm in a blind trust. Governor Kerry had called me. I never worked for him. I never gave him a dollar. But he called me and he said, I made a commitment to hire women. And I want a woman as superintendent of banks. And yours is the only name that keeps coming back. I could not say no. I didn't want to say no. So I put my firm into a blind trust. And we regulated all the banks, check and other parts of the banking industry. Now, but there was no banking insolvency under your tenure, is that correct? That is correct. No bank went out of business. But I forced mergers, and I got laws changed in Washington. But what happened, what I was seeing as superintendent of banks, is people were the oil-producing countries. I mean, Goldman Sachs had brought in eight Arabs that wanted to buy a bank. And when they left, I said to the partners of Goldman Sachs who brought them in, uh, tell me about the people. He said, they're very wealthy. They live in 16 tents. <laughs> you don't forget a statement like that. <laughs> I had a member of the staff, and I'll show you this one day. I almost brought it with, with me. Do a survey 
where I listed all the major banks in New York City, and how many barrels of oil it would take. I use Saudi Arabia as the yardstick. How much production to buy a share, and then I multiply it, applied it to buy 51%. How much production? And then I, I fast forwarded it to 1979. That's when the oil almost hit 40. Yes. And I will tell you that when I saw the result of it, for a day and a half's production, they could have bought 51% of Bank of New York. I took this down to Congress, to both banking departments, both the Republican Senate Committee and the, and the Republican House Committee and the Democratic Senate and the Democrat, they passed a 90-day moratorium on the acquisitions of major banks in the country because of that. So I saw what can happen as oil as a commodity, and that's what scares this me seems today. To be happy, this seems to be happening again. It's yes. happening again, uh -huh. at, but we have another set of circumstances today. You have China, who, which has a billion three people, and you have India, which has a billion one people, and they are growing and growing fast. And we don't, we had a wheat shortage, we have commodity shortages. <coughs> we also had, in the, these things existed in the 70s. Also. Yeah, when we were yes. doing that. So we we're basically so, replicating, you see we're replicating the 70s. That... There's a different world, there's a different economic. We are no longer the country that everybody's got to shop. You don't have to buy our goods. I mean, there are other, there are other countries that are producing and producing fast. Now, how damaging do you think that is to the United States economy? Uh, I think it's go it's hurting us badly. Our exports have gone up because our dollar has gone down. Because and. Can we get that back? I don't think we'll ever get the dollar back until the, the price of cutting the deficit will be very severe. 